Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who joined us over the past few weeks, welcome back. If you're uh, new to all of this, then, then welcome. I'm Mark Healy. I'm the executive director of the Ivy Academy. That's the learning and development wing of Ivy Business School in London. Uh, I want to thank everyone for taking time out of your day today, and um, especially for the support and the nice notes we've gotten from doing some of these live streams. I'm, I'm glad we found a way to provide some value. I you know, hope we do again today. Um, it's been you know, interesting to me watching what's happening around Ivy with some of our clients and kind of reactions and behaviors over the last 10 weeks or so. For about the first half of all this, I, you know, I think I saw speed, action, ingenuity, altruism, a real shift to a kind of a we not me attitude. I saw old battle lines go away. I saw bureaucracy and red tape and rules pushed aside and a focus on collaboration and, and, and on results. You know, but on, you know, for the last few weeks, I think I've seen a backslide actually into kind of old habits and old paradigms. I've seen the return of bureaucracy and rules and red tape, uh, a lot more me, not we, which, um, which, you know, sucks, frankly, uh, you know, none of us like this. It's, this is hard living like this and working like this is hard. We're not meant to work this way. No one's going to convince me that, you know, a structurally anti-social system is better than one where people hang out and go through experiences together. But I, I liked it a whole lot more for the first few weeks when we were kind of innovating at light speed and, and putting political small P and capital P stuff aside. And so, you know, somewhere in here in all this commentary, maybe at the center of all of it kind of lies character. Uh, our behaviors are tied to dimensions of character. Last week, we had Professor Mary Crossan on and a client, Steve Virgin from CRA to start a conversation about leader character. Today, we're going to continue that conversation and expand it into organizational well-being. Uh, we have another all-star cast with us today. We're very lucky to be joined by Mary's colleague that's at the Leadership Institute, that's, that's Gerard, and a couple of leaders in their field. So, so let's meet our guests. Gerard Seitz is a professor in organizational behavior here at Ivy. He's the executive director of the E&O Yanitowicz Institute for Leadership. Gerard has worked in organizations, uh, including you know, Acon, Intact Financial, Omers, Maple Leaf, Hutchinson Ports, Bank of China, and many others. He's taught in the MBA and the MBA and our undergrad courses in leadership, leading change, organizational behavior, and a range of other activities. And we have uh, Janine Pereira with us. As EY Canada's talent development and learning leader, Janine leads a team of consultants to plan and execute leading practices and build high-performing teams, increase employee engagement, grows leadership competencies, and effectively onboards new hires. Working with the firm's senior management and business leaders, Jean manages transformation change and seeks out innovative teaming and training methods as the industry continues to evolve. She has extensive exper expertise in diversity and inclusion, is passionate about fostering an environment of belonging in the workplace. And we have uh, Cheryl Pounder with us today. Cheryl's, of, of course, a two-time gold medalist at the Olympics and uh, also went a, a not-too-shabby six of seven, if I counted right, golds at the... <laughs> IHF uh, World Championships too, but uh, but today Cheryl's kind of better known as, um, or, or as well known as a passionate and invigorating speaker who believes that individuals and teams must be inspired by their journey. Each journey provides a remarkable opportunity to learn from success and failure, adapt to change, persevere through adversity. And uh, I, know, I know Cheryl believes that excellence is a process and it requires commitment, leadership, teamwork, focus, determination, and a willingness to take self-inventory. Um, so uh, all three guests, I think, will be will be fantastic today. Um, as always, I'm going to host and moderate. We'll we'll have our executive producer, so that's Sean Acklin Grant, with us. Sean's going to keep track of, uh, and he'll curate questions that appear in the chat and the Q and A. So if you have them, uh, please submit them that way. We uh, apologies in advance; we will not get to all of them, but we'll do what we can. Sean and I will come in, you know, with themes that emerge from sort of everyone listening. So, Sean, can can you talk a bit about what's going to uh, actually happen today? Thanks. Sure. So thanks everyone again for joining us. We have a really great turnout today and some wonderful guests, as Mark mentioned. So uh, please feel free to submit your questions by double clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of the window. You can submit as many questions as you like. You can set them to be anonymous and you can also upvote other questions that interest you by clicking the thumbs up icon. So as Mark said, we may not get to every question, but we'll try to incorporate some of them into a follow-up article at ivyacademy.com and, uh, and send that out to everyone who attended today. Thanks. Okay, so Sean, I think we've got a slide I think you're going to put up uh, just, just to kind of get us going. Um, so I just want to start with a little bit of grounding and a frame. 
Um, the, the slide that you're seeing here is the Leadership Institute's roadmap of leader character. Gerard probably doesn't like that word roadmap, but that's how I think about it. Uh, it kind of shows the various dimensions of leader character uncovered and cataloged by years of research uh, by the Institute and also the underlying behaviors that are tied to those dimensions. So we're not going to cover this in detail, but uh, you know, Mary reminded us last week that um, some of the virtues that are here in the absence of guardrails and other dimensions of character can actually become uh, vices. And so Gerard, you know, why don't we start there? Is there anything you want to uh, kind of add or, or top up to that? And could you talk a little bit about the Institute itself? Sure. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to talk once again about uh, leadership and uh, and leader character in uh, in particular. Um, you know, I think Mary did an outstanding job in in explaining the framework and uh, unpacking the various dimensions and uh, and elements. So really, nothing to add in in that regard. But I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, the institute and and what it is that we uh, that we do. The Institute for Leadership was founded in, uh, in 2010 as a direct result of the global financial crisis. And one of the things we've learned was that leader character played a crucial role in the lead up to this particular crisis. So leader character has been and will continue to be a main focus of the, uh, of the Institute. And so since 2010, uh, we've become a leader in research, uh, teaching and outreach on the subject of, uh, of leader character. Uh, it's important because our research and, of course, the research of others in, in the field has provided compelling evidence that characters related to individual, team, and organizational uh, performance. And so character, therefore, is not some kind of a niche topic or, or a nice to have, but in fact, it is an essential component of, uh, of good leadership. And I've got to tell you, Mark, uh, to see... Uh, People from so many sectors involved last week, uh, mm -hmm. this afternoon as well on, on the webinar is truly uh, encouraging. And it also tells me how broad the application of leader character is to the profit, uh, not-for-profit uh, sectors. And if I might say so, and I should always be very careful with, uh, with the assumptions that I, uh, that I make, but the, uh, the presence of so many people on, on the webinar, I think is a, is, is a testament to the fact that people want to do better, that people want to be better, and that people would like to lead with, uh, with character. Now, you also asked me to talk a little bit about um, uh, character and, uh, and the crisis. Of course, you know, um, I think the examples are, are, are everywhere to see. Last week, we talked, uh, we, we gave some examples around humanity, you know, kind of the, 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 the compassion piece, uh, the courage, especially the frontline workers, and the collaboration that we've, uh, that we've seen. To simply give you one example to make things come alive, perhaps a little bit, is this, uh, to, to illustrate this with this notion of, uh, of learning, uh, to mitigate harm and to learn quickly and to bring us to a better state. Mm -hmm. It is easy to see how many of these dimensions actually help to facilitate that learning, uh, humility, the love of learning, the sense of curiosity, the openness that is required accountability, not to blame people for mistakes that are inevitably made, but uh, to take some ownership, right? This notion around integrity, transparency, and candor is absolutely essential. But you and I know how sometimes uh, challenging it can be to, to speak, to act with, uh, with candor. So courage is essential. And I would submit to you that collaboration or the sense of interconnectedness is absolutely essential to make those uh, leader character dimensions or, uh, or, or elements come alive. And so Mark, the answers that we're seeking might not always be uh, within us, right? But certainly they can be found within the world around us. And of course, as a leader, it is your role to facilitate you know, answers to learning. And so that is, I think, one example where leader character really figures in as we work through the crisis. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, we've seen we've seen all kinds of questions uh, from leaders, you know, asking for guidance or advice or you know, uh, you know, seeking some sort of tool set. So, uh, agree with you. I think this is I think this is an excellent one, and um, it's a it's a really good place to start. Janine, I know I know you've taken a, a real interest in in character development personally, and and on behalf of your, your organization, can you talk a bit about that and how it's sort of applied to you and the the work you do? Sure. Um... So at EY, uh, you know, and I think at a lot of organizations, leadership is uh, considered a competency. You know, it, there are several competencies that move into le leadership that usually create 
organizations have a leadership model, they have a leadership framework, and competencies are in that. In that, um, what I think is is missing and um, is so critical is this piece that Gerard has talked about. It's leadership character, because people believe that, or, or some people will have believed that leadership character was innate. It's something that either existed, you had those characteristics, or you didn't. But what the research has provided is that you can define these. Um, it's a behavior, and you can practice it. And it's so important that we start to not only value leadership capability, but the strength of a leader's character. And so looking at today's situation, um, I think the piece around accountability is so important to me. Um, EY is built on uh, trusted relationships. Trusted relationships with our clients, trusted relationships with our employees. And we have, to, we have to understand that we're in a very different situation. Before we would approve somebody to work from home because mm. we couldn't see what they were doing. Now we'll be in a situation where we will probably approve someone to come back to the office. Mm. Um, and trusting your people to serve their clients. Our clients are gonna trust us to get our work done not being on their site. Um, and so we've got to hold each other accountable, responsible, as, as Gerard said, take responsibility, take ownership. Things are going to happen. Mistakes are going to be made. But that trust is so important um, and leaders have to foster it. Uh, when I talked about the capabilities and competencies, um, we have a great competency framework uh, at EY, Transformational Leadership. And obviously, we're, we're valuing and testing the capabilities of our people. But we brought about 20 partners, high-performing uh, newer partners to the summit recently that was held by Ivy. And there was such interest in learning more about their own characters um, and how do they build leadership character. And so we're going to look at using the assessment, the self-assessment that's available and um, the 360 assessment to help these leaders develop these characters that maybe we didn't spend a lot of time on in the past. You mentioned the the summit in in Toronto. I was fortunate enough to be there. George and his team put that on. I, Cheryl, I heard you you speak there. Um, you know, sometimes I think the whole obstacles question is a bit overplayed. But you you spoke about that in, in your remarks, and I just wondered, you know, could you talk a bit about that in the context of character and what what some of those obstacles that that you had to overcome in your in your hockey career and pr probably again later as you shift careers. What what has that done in terms of character for you? Well, I mean, which ones do you want to talk about, right? When I look at that, you see them all, and I, I, I kind of, I kind of mark them off and sort of check, check, nah, check, and, and so as I become um, or sort of learned about myself over the course of my career, as it sort of signed why sidewinded and taken all these kind of twists and turns, I've looked at them and been like, okay, so I've, I think I had more of that one in me. But that one, whoa, like that was learned. And then this one affected this one. So for me, when I look at it, I would certainly say that something like drive, um, drive to overcome those obstacles. For me, you know, drive is something that sort of sits, I would say, on my really good side, because I believe that that's sort of one of my, uh, you know, character dimensions. Uh, you know, since I was a little girl, I can honestly tell you from the time that I fought to get on that swing that was taller than me, I didn't want anyone's help. And I know talking to my mom to this very day, she'll say, Cheryl, like, I could not even help you. You had to do it by yourself. And over the course of my career, what I would learn is that that same attitude took place as I was working on teams, which wasn't always beneficial. I will get there. I will do it. I can do this because I had this intrinsic motivation to excel, to be a high achiever. It wasn't about wearing that sort of you know, getting that gold medal for the reward of it, it was about earning it. It was about putting on that jersey and the feeling that was associated with it. So that drive for me, I felt at a very young age. I felt it, um, that it was sort of that sort of all encompassing thing that helped me get up, uh, you know, when I did not make the team, the first ever Olympics that said, Cheryl, you can push through this and fight. And then I look at the element of courage, you know, the characteristic uh, dimension of courage, something that I think I found. And I think that I found it a lot of the time because of people who mentored and coached me. 
Uh, Gerard knows, and I've spoken about my grandma numerous times over the course of my career about how she had a voice for me. I remember her saying to me, Cheryl, you know, why not you? Why can't you go to these Olympics? And I was eight years old when I turned to her and I said, Grandma, I'm going to be there one day. So there's that drive. There's that unbelievable drive. It's an impossible dream. But there is, you know, women's hockey isn't even in the Olympics, but there's that drive. I am going to be there. And then there's my grandmother who had aspirations as a baseball player in the 1940s and said no. And I watched those opening ceremonies to the Olympics and I turned to her and said, I'm going to be there one day because that was the drive. But what she said to me helped me find my voice and find courage. So she said, believe in yourself, give it everything you've got. You'll never know unless you try. I don't believe that it was over there. I believe that she coached, she mentored, she helped me find that question, why not me? And so finding that courage, right, is something that was so key. And, and Janine, you talk about accountability. I mean, I don't think that, you know, I'm so driven that I, I, it wasn't my fault, right? Excuses, excuses, excuses. I didn't make the team in 1998. And the first thing I said, well, it's the coach. It's the leader of this group. They, you know, obviously they don't like me. Because at that time I was, I kind of sailed through you know, I'd made those teams, I'd gotten there. So the moment they said to me, oh, you're not, you're no longer good enough. It was no, not my fault. So the unwillingness to take ownership prevented me from getting back to seeking what I could do in my true potential. And what I realized in that is that, you know, accountability is a two-way street, right? If I needed to understand what I needed to do to get back and take ownership, I better damn well ask. I better find out what that leader wants from me because I'm assuming right now. So until I took feedback through asking and held myself accountable first, mm. that's when I started to grow. I found the courage and I found the drive to overcome the obstacle. So to I, me, I wanna... they're all sort of intertwined, right? For sure. I, I... Uh, I want to move us forward into the next topic, which is well-being, but just a one follow-up question, Cheryl. So, uh, you know, you talked about not being great at asking for help. I'm not great at asking for help. H have you yeah. gotten better at that through the years or no? Oh, I, I certainly have. I think that I've recognized, I take a, a real recognition as, you know, your drive is one of your, your greatest assets. And so, but you also have to be mindful and self-aware of what, which characteristics and dimensions are more privy to you. So that mindfulness that this is where I lie allows me to open my mind to see what I need to do to grow. So in doing that, what I've realized is that, yes, I need to ask. I need to share information as well because my strengths are something that I can lend to someone else as well. And so, and they can lend to me. And so learning to ask and share has been one of the key components to learning, but that has come from an honest and open look at myself. And, and that's difficult to do, right? Because when we fail or when these times, especially now, you know, where perhaps our lives are, are in turmoil and they've been turned upside down, you know, it's, it's very difficult to ask those questions to ourselves and reach out for that help. But that is essential, essential in my opinion to growth and learning. We need to grow each and every day so that we can be our best self, not just for ourselves, but for others around us. So, so much. Marka, uh... I just wanted to add that I think Cheryl's point around um, asking for help, often we think that that's a weakness, yes. um, but it really should be seen as a strength. I mean, none of us are a, a product of ourselves only and only what we do and and it's so much about who has influenced us, who has spent time with us, who has mentored us, coached us, the experiences that we have. Uh, and so understanding that you need to, um, you know, ask for that help because it truly is a strength. It's it's not considered a weakness. Um, and, and when have you ever asked for help and someone said, not interested? Like, that's really rare. Most people want to help and they enjoy that experience and it gives them a purpose as well. And I think if you don't ask, Janine, there's an assumption that you understand. 
right? So, you know, that assumption, then with that assumption comes an expectation. So then you don't fulfill your expectation, but you weren't aware of what was being asked in the first place. So I feel like accountability is that certainly that two way street. And, um, you know, I can rhyme off a, a gazillion examples throughout my career where, you know, Cassie Campbell Pascal. First time I walked into a broadcast booth, I had no idea what I was doing. But as a former player who had done it before and had been doing it, she shared. And so right away, I got one or two points that would help me in asking. And so I think there's a clarity and an understanding and that clarity helps us grow. Um, so our strength, uh, there's strength and vulnerability, right? There's extreme strength and courage and vulnerability. So, so much we could, we could dig into. I, Gerard could spend an entire hour. Just on, on, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but on we go. So we, we want to connect character to organizational well-being too. We, you know, we work with a guy named Mazzy who's been pounding this drum for a year and, and Sean and I weren't even really sure what he was talking about, but now it's, it's everywhere. It's in the headlines. And so, so Gerard is, you know, have you been doing research or have you, have you thought about the connection between character and, and organizational well-being? Absolutely, Mark. Absolutely. And uh, I can be real, uh, real short on this because it's, uh, I would say, one of the most robust findings in behavioral sciences and the psychology literature is the relationship between character or virtues and character strengths to, uh, to well-being. I mean, it's been well documented that, uh, that dimensions or, or elements like, uh, like gratitude, uh, zest or vitality, uh, things like uh, hope and uh, and optimism are are clearly related, right, to to well-being, uh, life, and, and and job satisfaction. Uh, you know, along those same lines, um, virtues that are that are order directed, like kindness or collaboration or teamwork. You know, they contribute to um, you know reduced uh, feelings of uh, of of depression. I think that's important. You know, our own research. You know, we, we focus on well-being, and you know, if if I can, like to highlight one such a study. We work with uh, with undergraduate students. You know, I think it's it's no secret that things like uh, like stress and uh, challenges are, are are rampant, right, at at educational institutions. So, we look simply at the relationship between uh, leader character, the dimensions and the elements uh, articulated in, uh, in in our framework. And to what extent <clears throat> that was related to, uh, to the well-being that students report, as well as the appraisal of challenges at the individual uh, or the challenges uh, that, are, that are personal in nature, social in nature, or, or things in the environment. And so again, the results unequivocally showed that uh, the relationship between character and well-being was positive. But what was even more interesting, we found, was that those high in character you know, um, they reported lesser feelings of, uh, of stress, right, of, of those critical uh, life events that, that might be problematic to, to, to some people. And perhaps this makes perfect sense, because if you think again about, about, about optimism, resilience, this sense of interconnection, having strong social networks, the courage to ask questions, uh, clearly that is almost like a, a buffer or, or some kind of a coping response. Right? That, that, that helps us to deal with some of these, uh, the, these challenges. So, you know, many conclusions from that kind of research, but the, the thing we always say is that character clearly is a personal resource that should be developed and nurtured. And I think it can use, uh, you know, can be of tremendous benefit, uh, not only to, uh, to our students, but again, people in, uh, in, uh, in the workplace. Janine, do you, do you... Do you resemble these remarks? Is, is this a conversation at, at EY right now? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, well-being used to be like a trend and people thought like, you know, this, this will be the flavor of the month. And, and now it's uh, absolutely critical. It's here to stay. Um, health is at the top of people's list when you ask them, what do you value about an organization? Um, you know, there always was things like compensation and training and mentorship, but, you know, health is, and the benefits around health and the well-being uh, uh, that they're going to be offered, uh, the opportunities are, are um, so important to them today. And um, I think about the characteristics and leadership character, two to me come to mind. One is integrity, which is being authentic and transparent in this environment around the health uh, things that you need um, and what the organization 
you know, you're hoping the organization will do for you. And then there's humanity, uh, which leaders really need to be empathetic and compassionate around what people are facing today. Um, you know, EY has this uh, all hands webcast um, every couple of weeks where we bring the organization together and well-being is a standing agenda item. It is continues to be the different offerings that are available. Uh, we have a live well site. I think all organizations are really putting more efforts and money into this. We have a $5,000 mental health benefit, one of the first organizations to do that. and. Today, mental health is, is going to be absolutely critical. We already know the issues that, that we're going to be facing in the future. Um, you know, two, two things that businesses could be doing well, and uh, we just started this, which is a return to work um, survey, asking our people, how do you feel about coming back to work? Um, what are your fears? What are your concerns? Do you want to come back? Why do you want to come back? If you don't want to come back, what's bothering you? And having that chance for them to speak um, and share, uh, we as leaders need to really be human around this. It's not going to be the same as the past. And and uh, I still think about this piece around um, the health and the physical health um, is going to be monitored, right, as people come back to work. And then the mental health is something that we really got to look after if we want great at our employees to, to thrive with us. Um, one of the things that I've implemented with my team is I have about 33 people across Canada and having regular touch points with them either as in a team or one-on-one -on -one allows me the opportunity to uh, get that two-way communication that you talked about. Um, and to be empathetic, to really understand their situation and, and think about how I'm gonna manage the fear that is, is, is there. What, it gives me that opportunity to address it. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we, we gotta do the right thing. We gotta do the right thing and we gotta detach from the outcome. We have no, we don't have full control. We have some control, but we don't have full control into what's going on right now with COVID. And so it's so important that we do the right thing in this well-being area and in the health area of our people. You touched on on mental health. So did so did Gerard Cheryl. I know you're you're a big advocate for mental health awareness. Can can you just talk about your perspective on kind of the connection between mental health and character? Well, I mean, if you look at mental health, and you know, it, it's so great when you know people are happy, um, and are they really happy? And, and I think that people themselves innately know whether they are or they are not. And when you look at the struggles, I mean, the statistics obviously are, are, are much lower in terms of, I mean, we're saying it's one in five. Well, we know in this situation right now, it's, 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 it's like one in three probably. But what I always say is, you know, if it's one in five that may be affected, that means the four of five are also affected by the one. So what that would mean is 100% of us are affected. And so whether or not you are the person that is, is struggling um, with, with your feelings or what it may ever, the issue may be at hand for you, the people that you know who know about it are also affected. So, so how do we work through this? And one of the things I, I love to say is people need to understand who they are and have the courage to stand on top of their story. And I know it sounds um, cliche, but I really believe that each and every one of us has a moment where we're that person in the middle, where we need to be pulled. And the only issue with this is that if you are that person who is in the middle, the people around you need to know so that they can pull you. And so in, in an environment, in a work environment, in a team environment, we, we can't help or will it just expect that you'll take the lead. So how do we use our voice and have the courage to stand on top of our story. And, and I know for me, it's courage. And I come back to all of the time to humanity and humility. And as I reflect, I'll think about, say, when I got cut from the national team, and I was at my all time low, um, in terms of, you know, questioning myself, the fear of failure was stagnating, I didn't know what was next, kind of like we are today, what's coming next. Hmm. And that unknown and that uncertainty was so scary. So instead of doing the things that made me happy, you know, exercise, getting out and walking, I, I really just curled up in my room 
And in doing that, I prevented myself from getting up. But I was so young, I was unaware of myself and what I needed to do to actually stop that. How I would speak to myself, the breathing, um, the, the thought processes, the positive words that I would use around the way I was framing it, my perspective. And so I didn't know this. So I didn't have that, you know, the humility, the ability to self-reflect at that time because I was in it and I was too far gone, according to me now. But the amazing part was I had teammates who recognized it and they so showed such great empathy. You know, they almost took me by the shoulder and said, Cheryl, and it was the little thing. It's, it's, we always think it's this massive thing that happens that sort of digs us out. And for me, it's sometimes one word one action, hey, the check-in, right, Janine? You wanna go for coffee? Uh, you know, Becky Keller, one of my teammates, she was playing in 2010, she was exhausted, she was irritable. She was the only athlete who had both of her children training full-time with her. And as she walked into her meeting with the coach and she was stressed, coach didn't ask what was going on in her life, it wasn't her business, but handed her a lollipop because her two kids were waiting outside. You know, these things that help you get back up. You know, I, I fast forward to 2002. Now I know more about myself. I've learned through these processes. Night before the final game, I'm stressed and I'm just about to go. I'm heading off into this abyss of you're no good, Cheryl, and all of this, this stuff. And then I thought, stop. You need to talk to someone. And I called my husband. And all he said was, I love you. And that was enough for me to bring me back and say, yes. I'm not defined by tomorrow's outcome. And so I think in today's day, this, you know, we have to, when we're the four or five showing that humanity, right? But we have to know. So if we're the one, we have to find the voice and the courage. And to me, write it down. Just write it down. If you can't get it out of your mouth, write it down. Because when it's a, you get it out, it's outside of your body. You feel like you have some control. And so for me, stand on top of that story and own your story. It's, it's you, it's your authentic self and be okay with it because each and every one of us has a moment where we are that one in the middle. Um, you know, Cheryl, you, I, I really liked how you said, you know, you have to balance that drive and courage that you have that is pushing you forward. That is, telling you do this do that you're great you're not and not beating yourself up for it right being really careful not to beat yourself up for it and I feel like that's a learned behavior because yes. I went through a tough thing in my um, career and uh, that was you know maybe halfway through my career um, where mental health really uh, my mental health wasn't great either um, and I had to learn uh, those characters and now I practice them and that piece around mindfulness and paying attention and empathy and compassion to others but also to yourself um, is a learned and a, and a practiced behavior and, and, and because I think Mark is that go ahead, sorry, Jared, go ahead. well I was just going to say I was just going to add to that because for me I was so high and dry right I didn't I wanted to act as if act as if everything's okay put on the smile shoulders up right because that is what I knew um, and because that is essentially, it's so driven in me that that's sort of what I would do all the time. And so once I started to ask, it's amazing because my, my, actually, I think my performance grew over the course of my career because there was something liberating and freeing about my perspective, how it had changed that I wasn't defined by one thing, one moment. And so the way I shaped it by understanding who I was and my own personal tendencies, because everyone's different, I was able to combat if you will um that that side of me that takes me down right and recognize what i needed to come back to my center which i call my perspective which is what allows me to have a, a mindful and healthy outlook sorry gerard go ahead yeah no thanks cheryl and, and i think mark one of those questions might always be or at least the ones we always get is character something that can be developed in people or by the time you're 12 or 18 it's it's this literally is here in the Q&A. One, one person literally asked that. There we go. Is this something that can be developed? And I think these stories shared by Janine and Cheryl actually articulate that. Listen, I should be careful. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. And be very careful with the advice that, that I give. But I think 
you know, there is things that we can do and quite frankly, do not cost a lot of money. You know, one of the exercises, you talked about uh, this notion around um, hum humility, right? Uh, an, an, an easy exercise that people sometimes refer to to start building gratitude is simply before you go to bed, before the end of the day, write down three things you were really grateful for that happened today or this particular week and so forth. You know, and it might sound very trivial and simple, mm -hmm. but there is clear evidence this actually contributes to a person's well-being you know, th through developing one's, one's gratitude. So let's stop pretending that this is something that is innate to people. It cannot be developed. It takes a lot of time. Her habits are always challenging to change, but it can be done, right? Either individually or as Cheryl articulated through some, uh, some, some uh, expert coaching or, or, or the people around you. We, um, t times are our enemies. So we we got to keep moving, of <laughs> course. But we did, um, we did get to one question from the Q&A, which is great. They're piling up. Sean, you've been paying attention. Is there another one we should be getting to now? I think uh, on the point of, of wellness and, and mental health, there was a good question from Dale in the chat around how trauma affects leadership and how trauma can affect your character as a leader going forward. Gerard, have you seen anything in, in the research around that? Totally. You know, again, if we start thinking about how, how leaders develop over time, uh, there is actually... Uh, it, you know, sounds so official, but uh, literature around uh, crucible experiences. Uh, sometimes we need to be shaken out of our comfort zone. Uh, well, I'll, I'll get personal here. Um, I lost my dad in a very tragic way. It was awful, uh, really awful. To assume that that doesn't do anything to you is just foolish. You know, I think it, it changed to some extent who I was, who I am in terms of my um, humanity and, 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 and humility. You know, the first time you get fired, when you, uh, got a when you didn't get the promotion you expected to get, um, you know, it, it, but I would say, you know, people go through experiences and some of those experiences could be very, very challenging, and, you know, um, but I always explain to, to, to the people you know, we, we interact with, an experience is just an experience. It's either a good one or a really bad one. For us to truly learn about this, we need to reflect. But you tell me, how often do you reflect? You know, we're all so busy doing things. You know, something happened or didn't happen and we move on quickly. Learning will only occur if you and I will take the time to reflect and learn. And you know what? This is a lesson I learned from Arkady Kuhlman, an Ivy grad. When it comes to sports, when it comes to the Stratford Shakespeare Festival, for hours we talk about why a goal was scored, why we like this particular play, and so forth. But when it comes to our own personal leadership, we don't take the time to do that. So to answer that question, yes, we are shaped by all kinds of events around us minor ones, big ones in particular, uh, but the learning truly is in the reflection and out of that reflection, obviously should come a set of uh, goals, behavioral goals that hopefully we can deliver on. Hey, George, let's just, let's stay with you for a second on this. Is good, this is good bridge to where we're going next anyway, which is kind of looking forward. Uh, no, you know, no question business model reinvention, bigger, more important than ever on almost every every front. You know, what, what role do you think all of what we're talking about plays in the nuts and bolts of business model reinvention? Business model reinvention. Well, Mark, you talked to, to a leadership guy, <laughs> organizational behavior, and this sounds very much like a strategy, but I will give you my best shot. Uh, Sean, if you can uh, throw up this picture that I think hopefully many people can, can relate to, to, at least to, to, to some extent. You know, I'm, I'm not sure about how, how many of you feel uh, about this, but uh, personally, uh, I've heard the metaphor a lot about, you know, the tunnel, we're in a tunnel, it's dark. We don't see the end of the tunnel. It's, it's hard to see anything going forward, backwards, or to the side of us. All of us are looking for this ray of light to see if something, you know, can be done differently. The tunnel that takes us to a better place, hopefully, a, a better destination. But even that better destination, even today, none of us really understands, has any idea what this might look like. Things are volatile, uncertain, very ambiguous. And I think, Mark, here's where leadership kicks in and perhaps leader character in particular, right? 
this is around this, this transcendence piece, this, this forward-looking perspective and this sense of optimism, right? When many of us feel down. I think this is this notion around resiliency to keep going and to demonstrate the courage. This is the notion around collaboration, a sense of interconnectedness that together we'll get things done. You know, this is part of the, of the leadership that might take us from A to B kind of business, you know, uh, transformations. Now, the fact that this is a tunnel is interesting as well, Mark, because a tunnel, that means we go forward, we don't wanna go backward. And in, in fact, I think there's so many things I don't wanna go back to, it's a tunnel. So what is it that you and I can do to transverse from A to B, right? And so the important thing I would also say is let's not go look back, let's not forget the lessons embedded in this transformation in, in our ongoing journey. I should say the hard won lessons because Mark, as you started off this entire conversation, uh, we see some disturbing behavior in society globally. You know, look at what happened in Toronto over the weekend. I don't think many of us are very happy about that. You know, the, the, the images, the pictures in the, uh, in, in the park. Let's not forget those lessons, right? Embedded in, in all of us working through this particular crisis. That's the reflection piece. And that's to be continually reminded about the importance of humanity and his concern for others. Anyway, that's my best shot, Mark. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, you know, Janine and, and Cheryl, you know, both of you, I think have, have been through and have seen reinvention. You're probably staring at it to some extent right now to, you know, to what extent are you, are you gonna kind of dig in on, on character, on, on well-being as you, as you think of a reinvention? Um, thanks, Cheryl. I'll, uh, I'll go first. Um, so, being in talent, uh, we've had to really reinvent the onboarding process, the training, the way people learn, um, the way we develop them. And a lot of it's had to move to virtual technologies. Um, people have really had to go through culture shock versus culture change. So no time to get ready for this. Uh, here it is and make it work. Um, it is, it's gonna be tough uh, and we're already moving through it. Some people are gonna love it. They're gonna say, this is where I wanna stay. I'm not going back to that old space. I'm going, not going back into the tunnel as maybe Gerard, Gerard's picture shows, right? I'm, I'm coming out and I'm coming out and I'm ready to do it this new way. And other people are gonna say, oh my God, I hate this new way. This is not working for me at all. Um, and I, I prefer some of those old ways. And, and so, so I think about the collaboration piece. We need to be flexible as we move forward. We need to be open-minded. We need to be uh, willing to work with each other to design the strategy going forward. Some of which we may have appreciated from the past and some of which we wanna move away from the past. Um, and really understanding that we're gonna do a lot more in the near future without traveling and without in-person. Um, the, the piece I think we've got to balance is the humanity piece. Um, and that is that not having any in-person may be what we call efficient, but not effective. And, and that, that is something we have to watch for. We don't wanna go down the road of not valuing the opportunities that exist in that in-person learning or in-person relationship building, et cetera. Um, and, and so I think about those, those characteristics and how we move forward with the talent and some of the things that we'll continue with and some of the things that we just, we, we won't do anymore. That's great. And I look at that tunnel and, and, you know, you get different feelings and everyone would be different. You know, some would see dark, some see the light as hope, some, you know, are uncomfortable. Uh, you know, everyone looks at that picture differently. I'm sure if the five of us walked through it, it would be, you know, everyone would say something different. And so that's life and relationships and everything is changes. Um, but change is part of life. Getting uncomfortable is part of life. And yes, COVID-19 was thrown at us and we have to take care of ourselves to take care of each other. We have to show humanity 
in a different way. And we're going to have to find in some ways, what does a new normal look like? And is it okay? And be okay with not being okay at times and, and voicing it and learning, learning throughout it. I know when I, I reflect and Gerard, you said it best. I mean, learned learning is reflection. And for me, if I say to you, when I started with the national program, they had zero data on female hockey players. They had nothing. I mean, nothing. It was like, do you play another sport? Oh, good. You know, four years later, you know, we're training at Valcarche, uh, the first team ever allowed on a military base. Uncomfortable? Damn right. All of um, our true heroes are being deployed to Afghanistan and here we are a team and they wanted us to see what, what the real hero looks like. So that applied some perspective, but that change, right? We couldn't control where we were because they put us there. They put us in an environment, we were secluded, we were isolated, we were away from everyone. They wanted to challenge us. And the reason why they wanted to is because they really wanted to see if we could find the opportunity in the adversity. And there's always opportunity in adversity. And it's how we react to it that makes all the difference in the world. And to me, the reaction is our choice. And so you have to know yourself well enough to be able to make the choice you want to do to take care of yourself and to push forward and look at it as an opportunity. Because if I walk from 2002, the night before that final game, we hadn't won one single game all year. And our physiologist wheeled 23 Monarch bikes into the basement of the Olympic Village and they asked us to do an impossible workout or what we thought was impossible. And we didn't understand it because we couldn't see beyond that tunnel, right? We couldn't see what was on the other side like we are right now and that is fear. And there is so much angst regarding that. So we didn't wanna do it because why are we doing this? For what? We don't know what the end is gonna be. And then we bought in and we chose to trust and what we bring as an individual. Because at the end of the day, we all bring something that can make a difference in today's climate. We just maybe aren't seeing it. And so we got on that bike, we trusted. And that next day, we won one game. And what people don't know, and I don't think I've ever shared this, is less than 24 hours before that game, we changed our entire strategy around how to handle our opponent. On, on the flow, right? On the mark, we changed it because what we were doing hadn't been working. And in doing that and getting uncomfortable and being okay with you know, the fear of the unknown and, and, and saying it out loud, it allowed us to pull in what our value is and how we can make a difference in these times. Because almost you almost have to sit down and say, what difference can I make? And you almost have to have a convert. I have a conversation with myself because I'm like everyone else. I get stuck in this moment. Speaking to a screen is not in my wheelhouse, right? But I'm learning. And every time I do it, I get better. And when we come out of this, you know, the myriad of opportunity might be different. And so what can you do today? What can you do in this moment that can help you help yourself through these times? And I think there has to be a real recognition around that. And we have to, in, in some way, shape or form, and not, we don't have to like it, but in some way, shape, or form, we have to embrace where we are. Mark, if I can just have uh, 10, 15 seconds. You know, this, uh, I think, uh, Cheryl, in your answer is, uh, is a great line embedded that I often like to share with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with my students. And that is that, you know, there's oftentimes a difference between seeing things and seizing opportunities to lead. And many people see things happening. Far fewer people actually are uh, grab that opportunity to lead and, and do something different. You know, I think that relates to judgment that goes back again to uh, to uh, to the courage that that we bring to uh, to the role of, uh, of leadership. But th those are critically important things to uh, to remain effective or perhaps become even more effective in a, in a high change environment. Hey, Sean, we should do some um, rapid fire questions. Yeah, let's pick let's pick two or three out. We've got a little bit of time. Sure. So right in the, the top of the, the Q&A, Thomas asked, um, 
he's understanding leadership as a process involving leaders and followers. And we've, we've sort of focused a lot on the top down. Um, what's the relationship between a leader's character and the character of the people they're leading? Do they kind of rise and fall together or does one determine the other? Um, Gerard, did you want to start? Right. Give it, well, give I should be shot? careful what I'm going to say now because we <laughs> had a wonderful field experiment not too far from Canada. Um, I believe, actually, I don't believe, I know that uh, leadership is contagious, uh, both the behaviors as well as the emotions. You know, there really cannot be any debate about this. Right? Emotions are contagious, right? But so is behavior. And I think in particular as a leader, you model the behaviors, especially, you know, Janine, you talked about new people joining the organization. People, you know, look at the leaders, people in leadership positions, they, they start thinking about the culture. They take cues oftentimes for the leaders. You set the tone. The way you act, give permission for other individuals to act likewise. You know, we always say cowboys, we get cowboys, buccaneers, we get buccaneers, and that's simply the way things are. So if we ever discuss and want to have a debate around how important is leadership to, you know, the people below them, I say it's mass. This is something that none of us should actually underestimate. You know, it's, I, I, I know it's that critical. Sets the tone. I, I want to do a, a follow-up because I, I see two in here, Sean, at a similar, right? There's one on toxic work environment and one on kind of having a bad boss and just, so, so we're not going to talk about how to change those, but what, what can we do in the, in the realm of, of character to sort of combat that or to tr try to change the culture or try to create a better workplace? Uh, Janine, I don't know if you want to take that one. I'm sure you, I'm sure you stare this down. Yeah, <laughs> right. I, I think that, you know, when you talk about the culture of a workplace, the culture of a workplace is not the culture of a thing. It's the culture of all the people that make it. So culture is really built on everyone participating and contributing into what is the culture uh, of the organization. And so, e you know, each person needs to, to believe that they have a role, that they are a leader in itself. Um, and they need to reflect. And I really like that piece around self-reflection because opportunity, you know, crisis, you know, brews opportunities. Um, and, and if you reflect, then you can seize those opportunities and, and move forward. Um, you know, the piece around the, the followers, leaders and followers, I, I think uh, the piece around the followers is that leaders, we don't want leaders to just be a top-down approach. And so you need to have a growth mindset, right? Leaders, leaders do need to set the tone, but they also need to have a growth mindset, not a fixed mindset. So, so believing that they can change, they can learn and that they can learn from the people below them. And in this environment, particularly where we are going to be innovating a whole new way of operating, a whole new way of working, building relationships, et cetera, everyone can contribute. And, and having that humility to believe that those people below you have something to share is so important. Yeah, I, I, I'm, that, that's, I, that's certainly in line with my thoughts and my experiences, Janine and Gerard re, uh, revolving that, you know, for us being on a team of, of approximately 23 women, um, I feel like the leadership itself um, always had the thumb on the pulse of the team. So they, they had the temperature, but it was all in the people. Um, the value that an individual felt in their role and how they felt valued. Um, and, and that could have been one minute of playing time versus 60. But if their role was valued in, 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 in a way by their peers and, and not necessarily always their leader, right? They would go to the end of the earth to engage and contribute to the best of their ability because they felt the value. And so I feel that the impact an individual has on the person beside them happens every day. And when you create culture, it's this, it's this feeling of value and it's an understanding that, you know, I can ask 
that question to the coach about, you know, so that I can be accountable. Um, and you can share information so that you can become more efficient um, because the learning continues, right? The moment we are stagnated is when we get stuck because we've stopped evolving, we stopped changing. And, and that happens when we stop forward thinking and being open-minded and listening to one another. So, you know, how does a duck become a soaring eagle, right? How do you get that <laughs> to stop in your work environment? Um, and that takes the, the components, right? That's not always the person at the top of the chain. It's, it's your room. It's the room. And so I think that we have to value that everyone possesses leadership qualities and they need, people need to find them. People need to reflect, to find where their strengths are in, in helping and working in an environment. We're, um, we're up against it. I want to, I want to do final thoughts and then we'll just remind everyone what we're going to do in terms of follow-up and whatnot. So Cheryl, maybe to you, just a, a minute kind of closing thoughts here, closing comments. Well, I think the biggest thing is, is get to know yourself. Um, the, the reflection piece for me is, is critical critical not just not just in these times at all times you know we don't always reflect because we're so involved we're so in our world that we don't take a step back to really look and see where the learning is see where the opportunity is and that may not look pretty you know sometimes and so you almost have to be able to have a candid discussion with yourself and how your behavior has been so that you can grow so for me you know what are you doing today to become more mindful and with that, I think you're going to see character being developed, in particular right now with humanity, humility, and the courage it is going to take to move forward in these times. So get to know yourself, take some time. And that starts with, hey, go for a walk if you need it, right? Get outside, you know, eat something healthier, right? Things like that that can help you start sleeping better, things that can help you become more mindful and, and be aware of your personal tendencies. Great, thanks. Janine, how about you? Yeah, um, for me, I think it's about um, finding your purpose. So uh, really looking back at uh, what is it that you want to do? What is it that you want people to know about you? Uh, what is it? How will you make decisions in the future? And if you have that purpose and it is able to help you in your professional and personal life, it's going to make a big difference. And this is your opportunity to build it. So I recently did a, a workshop um, and my purpose is to empower people to lead inclusively so that everyone can courageously contribute their unique strengths. Um, and three of the characteristics are in there, which is around justice, uh, around courage and transcendence. And I encourage each person during this period of time to think about that. What, what do you want your purpose to be? Um, and how are you going to live? Um, not only, you know, you made some remarks at the beginning, Mark, about seeing people go from the me to we, but now you're a bit concerned about where they're going, whether it's going backwards. And I'd say, you know, let's look at what our purpose is and what do we want to stand for when, when this is over? Uh, awesome. Gerard, Gerard, final word to you, and then we'll we'll do logistics and wrap up. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Mark, and, and certainly thanks to uh, to Cheryl and uh, Janine. It's always a pleasure to uh, to be with you. So uh, what Cheryl and Janine said was very self-focused, and I, and I, I completely agree. Uh, leadership also means leading people, and so for me, it's kind of the, the mentoring piece. I imagine that for so many people, there's so much learning embedded in everything that is happening around us. And so let's make sure the learning embedded in some of those situations is not lost on in particular the junior people among us, right? And so this whole notion on coaching, mentoring, helping people to develop, I think is a uh, critically important as, as well as we continue each and every one of us on our own individual journey. Awesome. Uh, Sean, can you remind uh, everyone where to find this, what happens from here. Sure, thanks again, everyone for joining us. Uh, if you'd like to share the session, it will be on our YouTube channel at the Ivy Academy uh, within a couple of minutes. Uh, we'll also be taking some of the Q&A. We, we, as usual, had far too many questions and I see some great ones around authenticity and diversity. And so our hope is that we'll be able to, to take some of those questions and go back to our panelists and maybe get a couple of offline answers that we can include with that recording. 
Um, I saw a few questions in the chat as well asking about uh, last week's session that we referenced. Uh, some of the materials from that are, are already up at ivacademy.com slash blog. Um, so again, thanks for joining us and, uh, and we'll see you next week. All right. Thank, that's, that's a wrap. Cheryl, Janine, Gerard, thank you very much, Sean. Great job. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks for having thanks, us. Guys. Thanks so much.